you already know. All right, so a couple quick introductions myself. My name is Miggy. My name is Miguel Cardone. I'm a designer advocate for education here at Figma. I also am joined by Alex. You can see Alex is in the file with me using cursor chat to say, hey, I'm going to use cursor chat back. I'm going to hit the forward slash key on my keyboard, or I can right click and choose cursor chat, and I can say hello, and I can let Alex know how I'm doing today. All right. So that's us. You can find me on X as at Miggy. Um, and you can find Alex as well on X, formerly Twitter, uh, at Alex underscore Figma EDU. All right. So a few things. Today's examples are going to rely on you having a, a pro team or above. And with the Figma for Education plan, we provide those pro teams uh, for free. Uh, but you do need to verify your education status and you need to create those education teams. So as part of today's workshop, I'm actually going to show you how to create an education team and how to invite, whether it be your uh, students or other students that you're working with, anybody in like a, a team project. Um, so I'm going to show you how to invite those folks and how to publish libraries in those teams. So we're going to be talking about components today. We're going to talk about publishing components. And in order for those to work properly, you are going to need that education team. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So the first thing, sign up for Figma. I assume that many of you, if you're joining this workshop today, you've already signed up for Figma. But the next step in that process is that you need to verify your education status. So many of you are coming to us with your education emails. However, there is still a step. So if you head on over to figma.com slash education, education, there you go. You'll notice that there's this get verified button. And when you click on that, we're going to ask a few questions um, about your classroom, about where you're joining us in from. So you're going to submit that. And then once you've been verified, right, and that happens pretty quickly. Um, so once you get verified, then what you need to do is create what is known as an education team. So I'm going to walk you through exactly what that's going to look like. So right, here you can see create an education team. If you're in the start file, that's going to take you to the help doc. That's going to walk you through that step-by-step -step process, but I'm also going to walk you through that process here. So I'm going to go back to my files and here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to click on the team that I'm working on from right now. And you'll see that it says this team is for education users only. Uh, any new users added to this team are going to require to verify their education status. I'm going to show you how to create this team. This team is just like the pro tier team. There are no restrictions on it, added restrictions to the pro team. It's going to allow you to make and publish those libraries as well as give you additional features such as advanced pro prototyping, as well as using audio chat and using video in your prototypes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new team and I'm going to show you how to do this. If you're a teacher teaching the course, a team is the same thing as being a classroom. It's a place where you can create projects and share your files. So I'm going to scroll down here and you're going to see, you can see I have a lot of teams. Down here, it's going to say create new team. When I click on that, it's going to bring me to this page. Now, don't get too afraid. Basically right here, this professional team is what you're going to select. And if you are verified, it'll say free for students and educators. So we're going to click on that, choose professional, and we're going to need a name for it. So whatever the name of your course is going to be. So I'm going to call this, you know, designing, designing, you know, components 101. Let's set our editors. So on this page right here, you're going to see there's an option up here. Is this an education team? I'm going to click yes. And you'll see that it's going to be created at no cost to you because we're free for education. There we go. So we're going to make sure everything looks right. I'm going to agree and I'm going to complete that upgrade. Now, once this has been set, if you're going to add your collaborators, so if you're going to add the students to this team so you can create and work on files together, or if you're a student and you're working on a team project and you're going to be working with other classmates and you want to invite them to this team so you can create libraries and, and work with one another, what you're going to do is come up here to this invite link and it's going to generate an invite team link for you. This is unique 
to both the starter team and the education teams. So here you can choose edit, you can copy that link. And if you're an educator, you can just go ahead and then set that to your, your course syllabus online if you're using Blackboard or my courses. But that's going to allow anybody who clicks on that link to join your team. So whether you're inviting your students or whether you're a student and you're inviting other people to your team project, that's going to give you the ability to do that. All right. So now that we've done that, I'm going to head back over to the team that I'm currently working on. This is the Making Components Workshop. And in that team, I have a project. And here you can see I have this file. And this file is where I'm currently working. OK, so we've created the education team. Now, if you're brand new to Figma and you just want to get started, you can get started with templates heading on over to figma.com slash education or figma.com slash community. Figma.com slash community. That's going to take you to uh, uh, basically our user uploaded resource page where you can find a bunch of different files and projects. And I'm going to be showing you uh, examples of some resources that have been shared by uh, community members today as well. Cool. So once again, we're going to be talking about components and libraries today. Here's a bit of the agenda of what we're going to be covering. So we're going to talk about creating components publishing libraries and adding libraries and making updates, right? We're going to verify, create an education pro team and invite others. Guess what? We already did that. That's fantastic. Let's uh, uh, let's cross that off of our list. What is this? Can I, can I cross that way? No. Um, yeah, let's, let's cross that off of our list. Number two, uh, we're going to do frames, arranging, resizing, constraints, and scaling in Figma. We're going to cover some of these basics before we get into making components because they're going to impact the way that you build components. Uh, we're going to talk about basic components and instances. Uh, once again, this is all about creating reusable elements in your design. So then this way, you're not making the same thing over and over again. Building a component, the main purpose is to build something that is a base unit that you can then reuse. So if you're designing an app, right? You're not going to design the same button, you know, a thousand times. You're going to design the button once and then have instances across your design. So we're going to be covering this. We're going to cover using the assets panel on the left. We're going to talk about publishing those libraries. And then if we have time, we're going to cover respon uh, responsive components using constraints and auto layout, as well as component sets, variants, properties, and if we have time, variables. So we're going to start getting into how to create more responsive components and components that can be more easily used by others and respond to different types of layouts or different types of modes, if you will. Okay, then we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A. And then afterwards, I will hop on over to a secondary live stream over on Twitch. We have our homework hotline Q&A. So you can feel free to join us there where we'll have another hour of content and a little bit more casual uh, sort of uh, arena. All right. So uh, once again, I, I see a few questions. You will get a link to this. Uh, the session is being recorded and we'll share that out uh, about a week or two after the workshop. All right. So we're going to get started just with some basics in Figma so you can understand and we can start from that baseline. The first thing here is I'm in the Figma interface. You'll see that I'm on the second page. Um, here, we're going to talk about frames. A frame is essentially a container that you're going to use within your designs. When you press the F key, uh, you'll notice it up here in the top left as well, the frame. Uh, it's kind of like your most basic container. So if you're designing for a phone, if you're designing for a tablet, when you select your frame, you come over here to the right and you can choose the different layout. Each one of these layouts is based on the viewport of the design itself. So some other design applications that might be a little bit more focused on illustration, you'll see different device sizes. And that's because it's designed for illustration. You're going to see its physical dimensions. However, whenever you're designing for a digital device, you always want to design to the viewport. And that is the dimensions that we represent here. So if I choose an Android large device, you can see that that is going to be the proportions or the size that we're working with. Granted, you can make that frame any size that you want. They act just as containers. So here I can make different layouts. So if I was designing 
designing for a phone, you know, if I was designing for a tablet, or if I was designing for a, a laptop, it's going to fundamentally change, you know, the size and the scale of the pieces that are going to be inside of that, all of your various components that are going to comprise it. So that's just one thing that I wanted to cover. So pressing the F key or the A key, you could draw out a brand new frame and that acts like a container for the content. Next, when you resize a frame, um, I want you all to kind of understand the difference between resizing a frame and scaling a frame or scaling an object in Figma. So right here, what we need to do is consider what you're doing uh, when you're resizing. So right now, this is like an iPhone layout. If I drag this down, right? I'm dragging it down because I want more space, not because I want to scale it. So you'll notice that as I scale this frame, let me move this frame down here. There are no constraints applied, but you notice that this object is not scaling with it and that's on purpose. So when you set constraints on objects, or even when you set constraints on components that get added to your design, I'm going to select this object here. If you're unfamiliar, I can just go to the rectangle key. I'm going to drag this in here. Let's make this nice and red so you can see how this works. When I select this inside of the frame, it's nested. So over here, you'll see there's my frame. It's nested inside of there. And you'll see this panel that comes up over here on the right. It's called constraints. So the constraints tell the object that's inside of the frame how to behave when that frame is resized. So here, when I select this frame and I'm resizing, it doesn't move. Now, if I select it and I change those constraints on the object, so I selected this object, I come over here to constraints, and I say left and right constraints, and let's keep it on the top. Now you'll see that when I extend this, it's going to flow to the left and right. Uh, if I instead say right, now when I resize the frame, you'll see it move to the right. Likewise, if I have a frame that has multiple objects, so one in the top left, one in the top right, one in the center, one in the bottom left, one in the bottom right, you'll notice that the constraints for each one is set so that way they're constrained to those corners and to that size, right? So this is resizing in Figma and it's gonna impact how you place things in the frame. And as you begin to work with components, how they behave. So that's gonna be different than scaling. So let's say if I was to have a frame and let's draw, let's make this look like a, UI card, right? Where I'm going to have some text. I press the T key to add some text. So I'm going to call this, I'm just going to add this as my title. Let's make that text a little bit bigger, right? So I have title, you know, maybe I have like a little bit smaller text. Let's add the uh, right text box on it. Let's put that as auto. And uh, let's make this just a little bit smaller. I'm holding down the option key. Uh, it could be the alt key if you're on Windows to click and drag and scale that down a little bit. So let's say I had like this like little card and I want to scale it. I don't want to just, you know, constrain it. So what I can do is you'll notice up here in the top left, there's the scale tool. It's the K key on my uh, computer. Um, so when I'm in scale mode, you'll see the UI change over here on the right. And this mode lets me actually scale everything. So resizing a frame is going to be fundamentally different than scaling the frame. And I can use a scale tool over here on the right to impact that a little bit uh, uh, more with more control. So I can select this and I can say, okay, I want its width as 400. I could say it's height, you know, oh, I actually want it to scale to its height. So I'm going to keep that actually at 600. I can adjust how that is being scaled. And I could even adjust the point of placement on how that's being scaled. So the text behaves with scaling. It's actually scaling the text. So you'll notice that the text value itself has been increased. So I saw that question. How does the text behave with scaling? So remember, to scale is going to be a different mode. To resize 
is to be different. And the reason is, is we need to consider how objects respond and how things move in that way. All right, so now let's get into components. Now that we've covered some of those basic concepts that you need to grasp before we get into there. Um, the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna make a very basic component. And what a component is, is uh, let's say if I were to draw a rectangle, right? Uh, let's make this, let's say blue. And uh, let's say if I was to add some text here, you know, I could say, hello, right? Let's make that text a little bit smaller. I'm just doing very basic examples for now. Um, so if I were to select this, let's say that this is something that I want to reuse again and again, you know, um, so I can select these two things. And up here, I can create this as a component. Let me move this out of the way. And you could see create component. I can make my UI a little bit bigger. So you can see that there, right? Um, oops, has to be selected, right? Right up here, create component. And what that's going to do is a few things. You'll notice that when I've created this as a component, it's kind of now in this purple frame. You'll see this little icon in the top left that has these four diamonds. It's been renamed as component one. Um, and let's just say that we're gonna call this button for the time being. If you look over here on the left, you'll see that there's the text in the rectangle that is inside of this component. Now, as I mentioned, components are elements that are going to get reused. So if I click over here in the assets panel, now that I've made that a component, when I go to my uh, basics components page, that's where I'm working out of right here, you will see the component that I just made is now available here. And I can actually drag those in. Okay, so I brought in all of those uh, uh, instances of this main component. So this is the main component. These are all now instances. So when I go back to my layers panel, you'll see that they look up and appear a little bit different. So instead of having the four diamonds, you're going to see this kind of hollowed out individual diamond. And that indicates that it's an instance of this main component. Now, if I go inside of that main component, I click inside and I move that text around, you'll see that all of those instances are now impacted by the changes I made in that first component. So here, if I were to, let's say, scale down the text, and if I were to move this around, you'll see that each one of these follows that behavior. Now, if I go to one of those instances, right? So here I'm in the instance and I click on that text, I can change that text. So I could type in Miguel, I could type in Alex, I could type in Lauren. So what I've effectively just done was created an override. So I can still control kind of like the X and Y placement. I can still change, you know, the color of the main component. All of these begin to follow. Um, and now what I can do here is any property that I have I can begin to override it and change. So let's say, for instance, I wanted to make this one pink and I wanted to make this one green. So you can see that this main component, um, it kind of sets the basis, but then I can have these overrides. Okay. So once again, the main original component is going to be these four diamonds. The instance is going to be this hollowed out diamond. This is the original, and these are essentially referenced copies. So one good example of that would be to make an avatar component that you might want to reuse again and again. So in this instance, I have a circle, right? And I have the text avatar. Now for this component, I need to begin to think about how this may behave. So my text field that I have here inside of my component, I actually considered the alignment of the text. So my text is aligned to the center. And you'll see that my text is set to auto width because I'm considering it being a single line. And I want the text to grow from the center, right? Text grow, you know, from 
sensor, right? I want that text to go grow from the sensor. So I'm just going to say avatar. So this right here, inside of that component, there's really nothing more than that text and that ellipse. Now, these are two instances of this component. If I were to make a copy of it, if I were to hit Command D, right, I duplicated the selection, and this is a copy, I can now begin to override it. So I can say, you know, Alex. And if I wanted to, I can grab a photo of Alex. I'm going to copy a, uh, a screenshot over here from the Zoom, and uh, I'm going to select that circle and hit paste. And what that's going to do is if you've watched our previous tutorials, you know that images are just fills on shapes. And so I'm able to come in here and actually crop that. So it's nothing more than a fill on the shape that's overriding the fill in this instance, and I can make those. So now if I have any other grander changes, so let's say, oh, Alex, you're always a star of the show. Let's say if I was to change like the font weight, um, let's say if I was to change the font color, as long as there isn't an override in one of the instances, you'll see that it then propagates to them all. So this is our main component. And then these are then the instances. So I can make changes like in the size, right? Any property that you have can then flutter down. So you can think of, uh, you know, oftentimes people are creating UI cards. If you think about like Instagram, right? You have that same kind of like card element repeated over and over again. You know, the designer doesn't want to fuss around with all those details. They want to make one card component that can then be reused. All right, so a um, couple things I did want to pull up here as well. So when you right click on an instance, you're going to see some options that you have here as well. So I'm going to show you when I right click you'll see over here, right? I can actually create this into another component so I can have this be a nested instance within a component. But here's some other options that I wanted to highlight. I can reset all changes, right? So I can reset those changes. So let's say if this component has gone too far and away from its original design and I need to reset those changes, you can see it'll go back to its original state. I can also choose to, uh, let's say I want to find the main component. You know, I'm somewhere in my file and I'm like, man, where is that main component? Um, I can click on this and you'll see over here in the layers panel, right? There's this option that also lets me go to the main component, right? So when I click here, I can hover and I can go to main component. It'll find it. Or I can right click and say, go to main component and it'll find it. So if you are using many instances and you're like, wait, where is the original one? You can always use that as well. And then we have the ever popular detach instance. So let's say, for example, I'm working here, but I need another circle. Um, this isn't the best behavior. You know, a lot of people who are trying to work on this diligently, but sometimes you're riffing and you're trying something new and the component that you have is too constraining for you. You can right click and you could detach that instance. And then it converts it just to a normal frame that is no longer maintaining a relationship with that original component that you were working with there. All right, um, is it automated new individual copy or do we have to duplicate it in our Figma? So we'll talk to you. Uh, you can go to the assets panel and just drag them out. So you can see my avatar. I could just drag these avatars right from it. The thing is, is this main component, um, if you copy and paste it, once you copy and paste, you're dealing with an instance. So that was, that was a good question. And hopefully I answered that question properly. Um, bah, bah, bah. so I can't right click on my Mac laptop and I have tried control click, um, but I don't get a drop down. Um, so I, uh, are you, if you're on a touchpad, you want to like double finger click, um, and, and that's going to allow you to, to pull up the right click. So there is always going to be a right click option on a Mac. It's going to be, if you're on a touchpad, it's going to be a double click, double finger touch and then click. Uh, and that'll pull it down. Um, you might also notice that if I if I right if I hold down Control and I right click, I'll actually see a layering of everything that's underneath. Um, so if, you know I have a bunch of stuff over here, I can Control right click and I can select whatever layer that I want. 
So that's a fun little thing. I just wanted to highlight that. Um, the keyboard shortcut to get instances, to get an instance, you just copy and paste it from the main component, or you pull up your assets panel and you're gonna grab them from there. Okay, cool. Great questions, everybody. Uh, is there a history of the changes made to the component objects? Uh, if you're ever looking for a history, um, you can go here to file, uh, show version history. And in the version history, you can go back and begin to preview um, the way things had looked previously. So if I go all the way back to this file, you'll see that I'm able to go back to the original. And then here, if I want to copy something from the layers panel, I can select, I can copy it and then bring it back to the, uh, the current version. Uh, yes, this will, this is being recorded and this will be shared with you all. Cool. So is there a way to find instances of a main component in other files, like go to main component, but the opposite way? Um, so right now there, there, there isn't. Uh, uh, so like, because they're, they're, they're going to be all over. So what you can do, though, um, the, way, the best way to, to kind of handle that, let me exit out of version history. Uh, let's say I have this main, you know, avatar, right? Um, what I can do within this same page is I can hit uh, Command P or Control P if you're on Windows. That's going to bring up the quick actions menu. And you could say select all with same instance, right? And what that's going to do is select everything in your page that has the same instance. So hopefully that's a, that's a good answer to your question. So let's say if I want to find all the instances of Avatar right here, um, I can uh, basically, I can go right here and say, select all with the same instance and you will find them all. So um, once again, select here. The quick actions menu can be found up here under the Figma F and you'll say quick actions. And then you're going to type in select all and you're going to look for select all with same instance and it will select all of the, the instances in that same page. All right. So next thing, what we're going to do, we're actually going to publish a file. I'm going to walk you through what publishing a file does and how you can access them. So here, I'm going to go back out to my team. And in my team, you can see that I have two additional files. Both of these files, what they do have is uh, components that have been published, right? So right here, you can see I have these four main components right here. And uh, you'll see uh, over here in this Google material example, right? These are material buttons and cards. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to publish these files. So then that way they become available in this file here, right? So this file, it contains these components. I'm going to click up here and uh, you'll see publish library. Now, in order for this to come up, you must be on a pro team or higher. Uh, for education, we provide both pro teams and for K-12, we provide organizations. So you will see this option available to you. If you're only on a starter team or if you're in your drafts, you will not see this option come up. So here I'm going to publish this library and it's going to give me this modal this modal is going to give me uh, a review of everything that I'm about to publish. So in this file, I have a few cursors, I have a few logos, right? And I'm going to hit publish. And so I'm going to add in a description of my changes. So I'm going to say, you know, adding all logos to a uh, published library. Okay. So when I hit publish, it's publishing the library and now it's been successfully published. So when I go back to my files, you'll see that this icon up here changes from being blue to black. And that black represents that this file itself has been published as a library. So I'm going to do the same thing once again, right here. And in this example, I'm going to do something just a little bit different. So um, here, uh, within my, uh, my assets panel. Um, let's see, I have a few things here. Wait, where's my button? Do, 
All right, if I want to uh, hide something, I can right click and say, hide when publishing. So you can hide something and we're gonna publish this library as well. So I'm gonna publish this library and you'll see the elements that are getting published. So uh, button dark, card states, stacked cards, and then there was one hidden thing that is not getting published. So let's go ahead and hit publish. And this can all be accessed from uh, Google's material design library. And I'll show you that in just a little bit when we start on some of the more advanced options. So both of these files have, both of these files have now been published. And what I can do is I can consume them into this file. So here, over here, you'll see I'm in my, I'm in my local components, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click team library and I can search for those other libraries and you'll see that they're right here. So here's my making components workshop team, right? And there's those two files. So now I can add these libraries to the files. So what is being done uh, yeah, cool. So they've now both been added. So essentially what is being done is that the components in those files are now available here. So I can actually browse over here in my assets panel and go to that Figma brand library. Oops, it's breaking right now. I know that they're making updates to this currently. So uh, you might see just like a, like that. That's probably what that was right there. Okay, so here I'm able to just drag and drop these elements right into my file. And now if any changes were to be made, so if I go back to the brand library and let's say I do something terrible, like change this red color to dark blue, right? That's not on brand, but I can publish this library. I will see the updates that have been made available to me. So avatar modified, I could see that those have now been updated. And when I go back to the file where I was, where I was working, you know, um, I will see that I have component updates available down here in the bottom and I can review them. So I can actually click on this avatar and I can see the change that has been made. I can do a little overlay and I can see the change that has been made between the original and the new one. And I can choose whether or not I want to update it. So I can click on this one and I can see, oh, hey, look at that. Here's the current one. Here's the new one. Let's do an overlay and see what's that change. So now I can choose to update that instance and I can update them all and go to the next component and I can update them all. And so now you can see that I've made all of my updates and here in my file, any instance that was uh, uh, that was in this file from that other library has now been updated. So uh, someone just asked me, what is the number that's that is showing while hovering on the component? That's the number of variants. And, and that's what we're going to be uh, uh, talking about shortly as well. Cool. So um, so this is not for all the files in the community, but you can download files from the community and then uh, use those in here. So I downloaded the, um, the Google material examples and you can see here that I have this button and it pops up. Somebody asked me about the variants. Um, what those variants are, are just kind of preset ways to change how that button behaves. So over here, I'm able to change these different looks of the button based off of different states that were created by the designer, but I'll cover that in just a moment. Okay, so right here on the left, I'm able to browse through and say, okay, what are the components that are local to my file? And what are the components that are from external libraries, such as this one? So if I change the color in my local file, I can't publish it without creating it as a new um as a, as a new component. So someone asked, if I change the color of my local file, which I can, um, 
it's only changed in my local file because it's it's just a reference to it. Now, if I want to go back, right, when I select the instance and I go over here in the right pane, it'll actually tell me, go to main component in library. And as long as I have access to it, it's gonna open that up in a brand new page and show me exactly where it is. So if I realize that there's a mistake on an instance, I can easily find the original. And so now if I want to you know, go back to this original version, um, I can do that. I can go here, let's go to my version history. Let's go look at my version history. And I can see when the components were published and here they were published when this was still red. And so now I can restore this version, right? Because let's say I made a mistake. I want to go back. I've just now restored this version. Um, I can close out of the version history. Now I can publish this library and you'll see the updates. So now when I go back to the file, I'm going to be uh, uh, alerted that there's component updates available. I can review them. And once again, I can, I can update them. And so now they've been updated here and here, because I did have an override, it's not going to kind of not going to change that. But once again, I right click um, here um, on this instance. Uh, what I can do is I can reset all the changes and it'll go back to its original version. All right, cool. So um, next, really quick, I'm just going to cover, this is an example that I have in community. And this is a way that I've worked with students previously to kind of learn components, but then also to learn auto layout. So what I did was I kind of made these individual pieces that kind of create a profile in the uh, frame of a phone. So what we would do is we would create a, a phone. They would go to their assets panel. And uh, here they would go into the local components and you can see we have the auto layout component activity. They would drop in the instances. Let me just move these over. They would drop in the instances. And basically once they have their instances, they select all of them and then they press shift A. Shift A is auto layout and auto layout is going to place all of those components inside of an auto layout frame. And this auto layout frame is going top down. And here I can adjust the spacing. I can give it a fill and I can even adjust the padding. So I can add more padding to the bottom. Um, or if I want to, I could add uh, padding on the uh, right uh, and the left and the top. Um, so if I wanted to make, I could make like a little card you know, that can then be filled out. So let's say if I, you know, uh, I want to place an image. Um, I can place an image. Let's see here. I have my assets. Uh, let's see, I have profile pics. And in here, you know, I have a, uh, I believe a photo of myself. There we go. I have a photo of myself and I can place that in. Um, and they can even use plugins like Unsplash um, to fill in like the background of the card. So let's say if I select that square, I could throw a little deer behind me or a fox or something, you know, and then begin to fill this out. Miggy from Figgy, right? Um, and I use this as like an activity to like learn how to build these components and then students will build out their own and they will uh, add their overrides uh, to build this out. All right, so that's just a little activity. So it's in there. It's also can be found uh, in Figma's community if you search for auto layout icebreakers. Okay, so people have been asking questions all about variants. Um, what variants are is they allow your components to have different states, different visual states. So the one example that uh, I've already began to, to show is let's say I have a, uh, let's say I have like a brand, right? Like I have like a, like a logo, it's in this case, Figma's logo, um, but I want different variations of it. So if I look over here, you'll see there's this color and there's this dropdown that lets me choose different variations of this same 
logo. So I can go black, I can go white. And even here, there's like a little bit of a, of a description of when to actually use it. So the component description, use on darker colored busy backgrounds, right? Uh, let's say it's on black. Uh, let's say it's on full color, right? Full color is just for normal use. Let's see here, you know, use on darker colored or busy backgrounds. I think they didn't put in the proper description there, but that's okay. Um, so another example is this one right here where I bring in this cursor and you'll see all of these different options. So I can choose a blue cursor. I can choose bottom left. I can make it top left. I can make it top right. So this is a component that we might use when designing Figma right, to allow us to create new instances of cursors without having to rebuild this cursor again and again, right? So I can make that yellow, I can make the outline black, and I can change that to Alex, and I want Alex's arrow to face me, or let's say I want Alex's arrow to face down. Now, the way that this particular one is constructed is that it is made in a component set where each iteration of these have been made that then have these various properties, which can then be chosen by the user. So I'll walk you through how to make a very basic one, uh, just so you can start to understand the concept. But here's just another example here too with material design, where they have their main button components. I can duplicate this here. And you can see I can change it to outlined. I could change it to focused. I can show the icon or hide the icon. And basically the way that this is constructed infers its use and this allows it to be used in this way. So by dragging it here, I'm able to adjust those variants. So let's say if I was to begin, let's use that uh, uh, avatar example where I created a circle and I had some text, so I'm gonna say, hello world. So the first thing that I'm gonna do with this is I'm gonna select those two objects and I'm gonna press shift A. When I press shift A, that's gonna make it an auto layout frame. So here we go. So ellipse, hello world, and we have it in this auto layout frame top down. And I'm gonna select that text. I'm gonna test the text out. So when I type it out, what I want that text to do is to actually grow from the center. So you see how it's growing from the right hand side. Let's say I go to the auto layout frame. I'm going to choose a line center. So now when I type this in, you'll see it actually grows from the center. Okay. So auto layout, this is in the center, right? This object is in the center. Um, and you can see that this is how it's behaved. This auto layout frame is set to hug. So it hugs the content that's inside of it, okay? So now what I can do, I can adjust the spacing a little bit. Uh, let's just change that spacing to let's say 12. And I'm just gonna type this avatar, there we go. So let's also throw a little stroke on this. Okay, I'm gonna make this into a component, reduce that stroke by Three, there we go. Let's make this into a component. I'm gonna call this avatar. And I'm gonna come up here, create component. So this is just one single component. Now you'll notice that that icon up there changes to add variant, right? So it says add variant. Once I add a variant, now you'll see it's in this uh, frame that contains both of them. And this is what's referred to as a component set. So what I can do here is let's say I put the avatar on top, right? Like the text on top. Um, so now I have two different versions. Now to begin to name, I know somebody has been asking about the questions for this, about the naming them. Uh, to, to begin to name these, we need to select the component set. So I've selected the component set up here and you'll see over here under the properties, this first property, when I click, I have to give it a name. So I can call this property, um, let's say uh, uh, title, you know, position, right? And the first one is on the bottom and this one is on the top. So let's see how that works out. When I 
duplicate out a, a copy. So I'm holding down the option key. It's the alt key if you're on Windows to make a copy over here. This is an instance. And now here in this instance, we have this property that says title position and it's there on the bottom. And now it's on the top, on the bottom, on the top. Okay, so we can continue this trend by making additional variants. Let's cl click plus. And in this one, let's change the auto layout to go to the right. Um, and here, let's move, let's, let's, let's count that one and let's add in another one. So here I'm gonna move this to the right and this one's to the left. So now these two have names. So it's gonna ask me the current variant title position, right? This one is gonna be the title positions on the left side. And this one, the title position is on the right side. So that will automatically update this instance. So here on this instance, I could say top, left, right, top, and bottom. So that allows me to put it in either location, okay? So what we can also do is begin to add in additional properties. So let's say I create a, um, another variant. Okay, I'm gonna add in a new property and this property is gonna be another variant property. And this property is gonna be show name um, and the value is going to be uh, false. Uh, or I'm sorry, true, let's make it true. Show name, oops, show name. Uh, and let's say values, true. Okay, so what I can do now is I can have a value of this and have this be false. I know I messed up. False, and I can uh, remove this from here. Okay, and then so basically this one will be show name false and this will be show name true. And so now when it shows up over here, I can show and hide that in that same way. And here we can begin to arrange how our variants show up. Oh, is this set to auto layout? That's set to auto layout. Let me break that auto layout so it's a little bit easier. Okay. So yes, you can also use Boolean values for true false. This is correct. You can add a component prop uh, we haven't necessarily covered that just yet. I'm just trying to uh, demonstrate how that can be set, this value. So we have a question. The proper answer for this is actually to use a component prop. So let's cover that really quickly, and then we'll head on over to Q&A. So here, let me uh, turn off show name. I'm going to remove that property. Uh, let's remove this object. Um, so right now, we just have bottom, top, left, and right. And as somebody mentioned, what we can do is add a component property. Um, so here, what I can do is I can select this avatar text. You'll see this little target here. We can choose the target and it's gonna select all of that text. And then what we can do here is add what is known as a component property. So this component property can be named show name. And we're going to set the value for now to be true. And we're going to create that property. So now we have a show name property. So the show name property will instantly make that property available for any one of these iterations. So we can choose to show and hide that property as we're making this. Okay. And unfortunately, we only have an hour to cover. Make sure you do join us more for the Figma for EDU homework hotline uh, immediately after this. I'm going to be Twitch streaming and answering additional questions, but we do have about seven minutes for questions. So I'm going to take a look at some of the questions that y'all have for us today. So let's see right here. Can you use auto layout instead of the scaling feature to adjust the sizing of your frames? So um the, the answer to that is, uh, I, I feel like the answer, the, the question isn't asked properly. Um, auto layout can be used to reorganize your elements. You can also use auto layout if you are, 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 are setting elements to fill. So if I was to have like, a, um, really you want to use constraints 
is, is the answer to how you might scale aside from the scaling feature, but I'll, I'll show you what I mean. If I were to select these three objects and I press shift A, right? They're now inside of an auto layout frame. So these three objects are in here. So this frame is currently set to hug. Now, the thing about this frame is that because it's set to hug, it grows to fill its contents, right? If you want the contents to grow to fill the auto layout frame, right? The second that I change the size, it changes how it behaves. It changes the resizing, right? It's now set to fixed. So um, in order to then have these grow to fill, you would then need to choose those items set to fill container, and then they will fill the container uh, as a method of, of resizing. So it's a matter of considering that. Now, if you're to use constraints, like we mentioned earlier, I can draw uh, like an object in here and I can set scale constraints. And those scale constraints now inform the object inside to scale along with the frame. So the answer is yes, you can use constraints to scale as well, but then it requires you to go through and, and, and set them all to scale instead of how else you might prefer for them to be resized. The answer is that there's no one true answer. Okay, so advice tips for easily resizing frames. I think I mentioned earlier the resizing frames, you want to go here to the scale tool um, and then you wanna resize the frames with the scale tool. In what cases would you want to group elements together before making them components? Is it a required step? So uh, what you could do is you can group elements using the group uh, option. So here, if I was to draw a few rectangles here, let's make those rectangles darker so you can see. If I were to select them and I hit Command G, so they're grouped, you'll see that they're a group over here. Now, a group doesn't have a set width and height. The group will always expand to fill its contents. A group is kind of like a temporary grouping of your elements that doesn't kind of have its own frame. However, if you ever needed to change that, you can come over here and change the group right to a frame uh, or back to a group or to what is known as a section, which allows you to you know, uh, uh, place together many frames. So the answer to that is, you're going to build things however you build them. More often than not, before I build out um, uh, components, I'm usually using auto layout frames first uh, before I construct that. Uh, does Figma have a glossary of terms used within the program? Uh, also, are there written tutorials for folks needing that for uh, accessibility? Um, if you check out Figma's help docs, there are tons of tutorials that are uh, written and available, especially if you're looking at some of the newer features. So if you go to help.figma.com, um, there are tons of actual uh, uh, documented tutorials. So if I say tutorial, Let's see, here we go, uh, build prototypes. Uh, there's a fully documented, written out explanation of that uh, that you can then find there. So take a look at our help docs is where you're gonna find the answers. Now for the glossary of terms, uh, one thing that, um, that I usually like to refer to, I know it's a, it's a bit adjacent, uh, is if you go down here to the little like help and resources, you'll find a keyboard shortcut pane. Uh, this keyboard shortcut pane helps you easily find the shortcuts that you use. You'll see that I use a lot of shortcuts when I demo. Um, this also helps me familiarize myself with the capabilities within the product itself. Uh, when I was first learning Figma, I was in this keyboard pane, kind of like looking for all of these objects. Now, the key thing here is that if you're joining us from Paris, if you're joining us from Spain, if you go to layout, you can view your keyboard shortcuts um, arranged 
based off of your specific keyboard. So you'll see that I just changed my keyboard layout to French Azerty. So when I go to uh, my essential tools, you'll see that these uh, fundamental keyboard shortcuts are very different than what they uh, may have originally appeared as. Uh, also, if you are working on a Chromebook or if you're working on a Windows machine, you're going to see the shortcuts that are including the modifier keys that are specific to your OS. So I'm going to go back down to, let's go back down to the US. Oh, not Dvorak. I want US QWERTY. Where was I? There I go. US QWERTY. That's me. All right, cool. Um, let's see, I'll do one last one. Uh, if we resize the component, the text size also change. So once again, the, that's actually a fantastic question. It'll help me wrap things up. So if I were to make a component, uh, I have this frame and let's say I have this text inside. So I have this text right inside of this component. Okay. And this frame, I, I make this a component. Um, when I resize it, the resizing of the component itself is dependent on either if it's using auto layout or if it has set constraints. So if I go to this main component and I click on that object and I change those constraints from being left and right to sensor and sensor, now when I go here, you'll see that it stays in the center. If I change that to scale and scale, now when I resize the component, oops, it's not scaling. Oh, actually, you know what? I think it is scaling, but it's scaling like um, it's not honoring it. Let's try this one more time. Let's see. Yeah, it's not going to scale it with text. Um, so in order to scale the component, you're going to have to use the scale tool, pressing the K key, and that's going to allow that to, to scale. So in order to resize the component, you might apply one thing, but in order to scale the component, you are going to want to do that different action just that way and that I that I pro pro provided for you, okay? All right, cool. So that's it for now. Uh, I am gonna be hopping on to a Twitch stream now to answer additional questions, uh, make some additional components. Uh, so you can join me on Twitch TV underscore uh, forward slash Miggy underscore from underscore Figma. Uh, so I'll just paste that right there. So I'm gonna be signing off here. Uh, once again, this was, you know, using components and libraries. It's kind of like a primer and intro. There's still much, much more to dig into. This session could be three hours and we wouldn't cover everything. Um, so feel free to join me in the Twitch stream. Um, thank you. You are all fantastic. Uh, once again, big shout out to Alex for dropping all the links, providing all the support, setting up the Zooms and everything. Uh, thank you all for joining me from across the world. I hope you have a wonderful, you know, morning, evening, you know, good afternoon, uh, wherever it is that